A quick heads up, this episode contains strong language and scenes depicting sexual abuse. Please be advised. Jessica Simpson is about to perform at the biggest concert of her life. She's standing backstage waiting for her turn to shine. Her palms are clammy, her stomach's in knots. Christina Aguilera is going on before her. Justin Timberlake is up later in the lineup. These guys are really good. And Jessica isn't totally sure she belongs in their league. She looks herself over in the mirror one last time. Her outfit is right off the $5 rack at a local discount store, literally. She's got a floppy hat over her long blonde hair, a denim jacket, and a men's tie with pigs on it. So wild. That's what I was wearing in my farmer's only profile. Oh my God, that explains all the overalls. Yeah. It's 1993 and Jessica Simpson is just 13 years old. Same for Christina Aguilera. Justin Timberlake is only 12. They're part of a handful of talented young performers who are vying for a role on Disney's reboot of the Mickey Mouse Club. And this is the final audition. 11 kids, eight open spots. Okay, I like those odds. Yeah, so does Jessica, which is good because the stakes couldn't be higher. Jessica doesn't just want this for herself. She wants it for her family, her mom, Tina, her dad, Joe, and her little sister, Ashley. The Simpsons are a smart clan with a lot of talent, but what they don't have a lot of is money. And if Jessica nails this audition, it would go a long way towards fixing that problem. Feels like a lot of pressure for a 13 year old. Yeah, too much, which might be why Jessica is having so much trouble getting her nerves under control. She keeps telling herself, be confident, you can do this. But then she hears a very different voice. And that one's screaming, no, you can't do this at all. That new voice sounds a lot like Christina Aguilera. She's totally and completely rocking her audition on stage. Christina's voice has a strength and power that Jessica's never heard before. It's so confident. And Jessica is not. Her whole body tenses up. She's up next. She looks to her mom for support, but her mom's jaw is still on the floor. Christina's performance has totally blown her away. Tina shakes her head and says, how is that even possible? Yeah, the other three singers on Lady Marmalade felt the exact same way. (laughs) So true. (laughs) And now all eyes are turning to 13-year-old Jessica Simpson with her bargain rack outfit and the pig tie. Jessica walks onto the giant stage and starts to sing. And she sings well. But now there's yet another voice in her head that keeps telling her she could be doing better. She tries to tell it to shut up, but by the time she moves on to the dance part of the audition, that voice is screaming back. It's like, singing's supposed to be your strong suit, Jessica. That was your chance and you blew it. I mean, it's very hard to dance while you're having a screaming match with your inner critic. Jessica blows a bunch of dance steps she had down cold just hours earlier. And by the time the acting portion rolls around, she just freezes. She goes completely blank during her monologue and just stares into the camera. It's just like Torrance's nightmare at the beginning of Bring It On. Everyone's staring and your tits are out. Oh, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Except this isn't a dream. Seconds tick by as Jessica stares straight ahead, a total deer in headlights. Every moment feels like a year. Finally, she just says thank you and walks off the stage. Justin Timberlake is waiting in the wings, his eyes huge. What did you just do? He asks her. (laughs) Jessica doesn't know what she did. She feels like she left her body halfway through the audition. But she knows that whatever it was she did out there, it wasn't good enough. She wasn't good enough. The really sad thing is, this isn't the first time she's had that thought about herself. And it's not going to be the last either. 
Because even though she's going to grow up to be beautiful and wealthy and loved, Jessica Simpson is going to spend most of her life convinced that she's just not good enough. From Wondery, I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And I'm Brooke Sifrin. And this is Even the Rich, where we bring you absolutely true and absolutely shocking stories about the biggest celebrities the world has ever seen. It's a show about power, how you get it, how you keep it, and what happens when you nearly lose it all. It's also about how the rich are just like us, because even the rich fall in love and break up and struggle and embarrass themselves in front of Hollywood's future (sighs) A-listers. We've all been there. (laughs) Brooke. Arisha. How much of Newlyweds, Nick and Jessica, did you watch back in the day? I think I watched all of it, actually. Like, Chicken of the Sea will forever be burned in my brain. It's forever burned in all of our (laughs) brains. But there's so much more to Jessica Simpson than that one moment from 14 years ago. Everyone tried to make it seem like she was just a blonde bimbo, but she's always been much more than that. In fact, she's a bona fide businesswoman now. Yeah, isn't her company worth like a billion dollars? Yes. Kim and Kylie might get all the shine now, but Jessica Simpson did it first. She's a goddamn pioneer. A big part of her appeal has always been her ability to laugh at herself. But behind the scenes, she was dealing with things that were no laughing matter. Insecurities, addictions, and traumas that nearly took her out. So buckle up. For the next four weeks, we're bringing you the story of the life and career of singer, actress, reality star, and fashion mogul Jessica Simpson. And I promise you, it's a saga. This is episode one, Amazing Grace. It's 1982. The movie E.T. is crushing it at the box office. Eye of the Tiger is on top of the charts. Wow, big year for hits. (laughs) And it's about to get even bigger because two-year-old Jessica Simpson is sitting in the kitchen with her mother, Tina. Jessica's bawling her eyes out. She's uncontrollable. Her mom is at her wit's end. Poor Tina's like, what is it, Jessica? Just tell me what you want. But she can't. Every time Jessica tries to answer her mom, she completely freezes. It feels like she's got 10 conversations going in her brain at once, but she can't get any of the actual words out. Instead, she just stutters. She gets hung up on the same syllable over and over again. It started a few months ago when Jessica and Tina got into a major car accident. Jessica flew from the backseat of their beat-up Chevy Nova and got stuck halfway through the windshield. It was a legit near-death experience, but Jessica escaped with just a concussion and a deeply frustrating stutter. Oh my God, poor thing. I'd be crying all the time too. Yeah, same. Now remember, Jessica's only two. She barely has the words to explain herself as it is. And now the ones she does have won't come out. But then her mom tries a Hail Mary, last ditch, hope against hope plan. Tina leans in close and tells Jessica, whatever you're trying to say, sing it to me. And just like that, something clicks. The gears that have been frantically turning behind Jessica's eyes stop. Then she opens up her mouth and sings, I want Cheerios. Wow. Give this child and Arisha a record deal stat. (laughs) Well, I'm still dealing with my podcast deal, so we'll leave the singing to Jessica for now. Okay. Because everything just changed for her. The whole trajectory of her life. A wave of exhilaration shoots through her body. For the first time in her life, she's feeling the relief and joy of finally being understood. Tina sweeps Jessica up in her arms and spins her around the kitchen. You can have Cheerios, Tina proclaims. You can have whatever you want. You sound so beautiful. Even though Jessica can sing at will, her stutter continues. And since you can't sing your way through every single elementary school conversation, 
Jessica grows up to be a painfully shy kid. It doesn't help that her family is constantly on the move. Her father, Joe, works as a youth minister in the Baptist church. And here's the thing, he's great at his job. He's warm, friendly, and charismatic. Joe Simpson is the kind of guy who only needs a handshake and 15 seconds to get you super excited about whatever he's excited about. And what he's excited about is Jesus. Not the fire and brimstone Jesus, but the loving, forgiving Jesus. When it comes to the church, Joe and Tina don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. They're always there for kids struggling with teenage pregnancy or drug abuse or problems at home. Okay, they sound like pretty good people. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, they are. Joe's the pitchman. He could sell a glass of water to a drowning man, as they say. (laughs) And Tina's the doer. She makes things happen. At one point, she starts a Jane Fonda-type aerobics class called Jump for Jesus. Um, okay, I'm listening. (laughs) She shouts things like, let's stretch those arms to the heavens and get those legs up for Jesus. Okay, pretty sure we're not supposed to be putting our legs up for Jesus. Uh, Tell that to Cameron's Cameron Bure. (laughs) When they're at church, Joe and Tina, though, are unstoppable. They find the work really fulfilling, and Jessica grows up feeling really proud of what they do. But here's the problem. When you work in the church, the church is also a business. And for Joe, business is usually pretty lousy. These youth minister jobs pay him a whopping 25 grand a year. And even in 1980s dollars, that's not enough to support a family of four. It bothers Joe and Tina a lot. At home, they fight about money constantly. They're always working on new plans and new ideas to bump up that household income. But as smart and charismatic as Joe is, money's always slipping through his fingers. And that means he's always moving the family in search of greener pastures. So whatever friends Jessica makes at each new place, she has to say goodbye to them when the family moves again. They move 18 times before Jessica hits fifth grade. Mm. There's even a bankruptcy in the mix too. So life is pretty stressful for the Simpsons. But if there's one place that's a sanctuary for Jessica, it's the church. It's the one familiar thing that she can rely on, no matter where the family lands. Same beliefs, same traditions, same music. And it's the one place she knows she can sing. Through all the years of moving around, singing is still the only time Jessica really hears her own voice. She's a super quiet kid. But even though she never complains, it isn't because she doesn't have anything to say. There's a lot going on under the surface with her. People might see this beautiful blonde preacher's daughter and think everything was A-OK. But there's a lot she's been keeping to herself. Well, I mean, between the stuttering and all the moving, like that's a lot for a kid to deal with. Yeah, true. But it's not just that. There's something else she's been keeping quiet about. Something that's much worse. It's something that haunts her every day and keeps her from falling asleep at night. So about three times a year, the Simpsons visit some family friends. This couple has a daughter who's a year older than Jessica. They share a bed together every time Jessica visits. And starting when she's six, the older girl touches Jessica inappropriately. Jessica's reaction is to freeze. This goes on three times a year for six years, every time the family visits. Jessica desperately wants to tell someone what's happening, but she doesn't. She can't find the words. And it's not like singing is going to help her get this out. It's too terrifying. And every time she comes close to saying something or confronting the girl who abused her, the same old feeling that she had with her stutter comes back. The thoughts just swirl around in her head, but she can't get the words out. So Jessica tries to let it go, but the abuse doesn't stop. Finally, in 1993, Jessica's 12 years old and riding in the car with her parents and Ashley. They're headed back home after a weekend with the family friends, and Jessica's finally reached a breaking point. If she keeps this secret one more day, she's going to explode. But she doesn't want to bring it up in front of Ashley. When her father stops for gas, he returns to the car with two lottery tickets, one for Jessica and one for Ashley. It's something he does every time they make this trip. 
and more often than not, Jessica wins money. But she doesn't scratch her ticket right away. Ashley's like, well, mine's a loser, and she puts her headphones back on. Jessica realizes this is her chance to finally speak up. She looks at her quarter, poised over the lottery ticket, and sees the words, in God we trust. It's a sign. Jessica makes a silent deal with God. If I do this, speak my truth, my reward will be in this ticket. So she tells her parents what's been happening. The words come out in a quiet rush and end with her saying, it makes me really uncomfortable and I don't ever want to go back there. There's a moment of silence in the car. Then her mom smacks her father's arm and says, I told you something was happening. Wait, her mom knew? Why didn't she do anything? Well, we'll never know because that's all either of Jessica's parents ever say about the matter. Which is why Jessica kind of feels better, but also frustrated. I mean, it's clear they discussed the possibility with each other, but nobody ever thought to talk about it with her. Nobody's helping her. She thinks about all those runaway teens and drug addicts her parents have helped over the years. And she's like, what about me? When the car's back on the highway, Jessica looks down disappointed and scratches the lottery ticket. It's another winner, but Jessica's not feeling super excited right now. She just hands the ticket over the seat to her mother, who looks at it and shrieks, $1,500, woohoo! And soon Joe and Ashley are screaming too. The whole family's thrilled about the money and the change of subject. Later that same year, Jessica is in a giant church singing Amazing Grace with 700 other kids around her age. It's the last day of church camp and Jessica's really feeling the spirit. Compared to school where she always feels like an outsider, At camp, she feels like she belongs. She feels connected to something bigger than herself. And today her connection to God feels supercharged somehow. And her singing reflects that. Just like when she was that little stuttering kid who wanted Cheerios, it's so much easier to express herself through singing than speaking. And today, singing with this big group in this big church feels transcendent. At one point between verses, the pastor raises his hands and proclaims, there's somebody here today that's going to use their voice to change the world. They will use their voice to minister to others. When he says that, Jessica feels a flood of light move through her body. She thinks, it's me, it's my voice. He's totally talking about me. Next thing you know, Jessica's walking down the aisle toward the pastor, alone. No one else is walking anywhere. The other 700 or so campers are just singing in place. But Jessica is sure God wants her to use her voice. She just never knew how exactly, until now. She gets to the pastor just as the hymn finishes and whispers, I just heard myself sing and I think that's the voice that God wants me to use. The pastor smiles and says, well, let's pray. As the prayer unfolds, Jessica feels this warmth come over her, like God's just given her a calling and revealed to her who she's supposed to be. After the prayer finishes, she rushes straight to the payphone in the lobby to call her dad back home. She breathlessly announces, God called me into the ministry, dad. And her dad's like, no, 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 no. Wait, I thought this guy's whole thing was loving church. Yeah, but that just means he knows what church life is really like behind the scenes. Joe's actually a pretty forward-thinking voice in the church. He's not into blaming sinners and pounding the pulpit about hellfire and damnation. He just wants to spread God's love, and he knows how unpopular that can be. But he also knows there's no money in the church, and he does not want that life for his little girl. So when Jessica says, I know now I'm supposed to use my voice to change the world, Joe's like, well, Jess, there are other ways to do that. Interviewing candidates for an open role can be daunting when you're trying to go from a quality pool of applicants to one great hire. So how do you find the right fit for you? 
Oh, of course I know this one. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Mm, Nailed it. (laughs) Indeed is your go-to hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. That means you won't struggle on your own to find quality candidates because Indeed can help you hire the right people right now. Yeah, one of the things that I think is pretty much the coolest about Indeed is that 73% of all online job seekers in the U.S. visit Indeed each month, according to Comscore Total Visits, which means they're already there and ready for you. Yeah, and thanks to Indeed's virtual interviews, you can message, schedule, and interview top talent seamlessly, all in one place. And there's no need to install anything extra. Indeed's virtual interviews work from your browser. And you don't need to wear pants. (laughs) That will always be <laughs> the highest draw. Yes. You can get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash rich. That's a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash rich. One more time. That's Indeed.com slash rich. Offer valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Mama, mama, la. It's 1993. 12-year-old Jessica Simpson is standing on stage in San Marcos, Texas, and she's hearing the sweetest sound in the world. Applause. She's been singing all her life, but nobody claps in church. Out here, though, in the secular world, people are going crazy for her performance of Bette Midler's The Rose. Some say love. If you can believe it, it was even better than that. I don't believe it. (laughs) I'm picturing people holding up cigarette lighters and crying in some tiny community hall. Jessica's belting out lyrics like, it's the dream afraid of waking that never takes the chance. Well, Jessica just took the chance and she rocked it. And now she's beaming as she walks off the stage, her big purple thrift store dress swishing around her. Just like that, Jessica's first singing competition victory is in the books. And she wants more. She starts doing bigger regional contests. And she keeps winning. She upgrades her wardrobe from thrift shops to Dillard's department store. With the tag still on, of course, so her mom can return them the next day. (laughs) Money's still tight. But Jessica and her parents know that's about to change. They don't know how exactly but they've got faith. And then one day, it's ask and he shall receive time at the Simpson house because Tina comes home from church with a tiny little clipping from the Dallas Morning News, an open call edition for Disney's all new Mickey Mouse Club. Jessica freaks out. She's a loyal Mickey Mouse Club viewer and she spent many a weekday afternoon singing and dancing along to Mouseketeers like J.C. Chazé and Carrie Russell. Ah, uh, yes, Carrie Russell, the songbird of our generation. Mm-hmm. Also the Soviet <laughs> spy. <laughs> but here's the thing. The Mickey Mouse Club cast kids who are relatable. They want real boys and girls that audiences can connect with. And that's why every year they hold open auditions all over the country. 50,000 kids try out. When Jessica sees the ad, she's like, stop looking, I'm right here. Except obviously it's not that simple. The next weekend, Jessica's standing in line with thousands of other local kids outside the Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Dallas. It takes her hours just to get into the building, but she's not worried. It's not that she's arrogant. She just knows that God wants her to use her voice. So that's what she's going to do. And before they even hear her, the casting directors are all in. They're like, ooh, Cindy Crawford. Yeah, because nothing screams relatable like Cindy Crawford. I know, it's so on brand for Mickey Mouse. (laughs) Yeah. But Jessica doesn't care. When it's her turn to sing, she hits them with the song she was singing when she was called in church, Amazing Grace. And everyone in the audition room is feeling it. The next day, the roster gets cut down from thousands of kids to 10. And one of them is Jessica Simpson. At the end of day two, the casting director pulls Jessica aside. He's like, we're sending you to Orlando for the final auditions, but there's just one thing. You've got to work on your acting. 
So the Mickey Mouse Club is a variety show. It's not just singing. Jessica's got to be able to pull off skits too. And apparently her work in that department is a little rough. (laughs) But not to worry, the casting director knows just the guy to teach Jessica how to act in under two weeks. Joey Tribbiani. (sighs) So close. This guy's bigger, more experienced, more talented. At least if you're thinking about this from a Texan's point of view. This acting guru is none other than the most talented man in film history, Chuck Norris. I mean, it makes sense. Chuck Norris once did a whole movie speaking into a mirror because no other actor could match his intensity. (laughs) I mean, this is for the Mickey Mouse Club. So it's go big or go home. (laughs) Which is why a few days later, Jessica is sitting on a cold folding chair in a strip mall acting studio outside Dallas. And for the first time in this whole process, she's feeling intimidated. In person, Chuck Norris is super intense. I mean, this is the guy who lost his virginity before his father. (laughs) You mean Chuck Norris, the man who makes onions cry? No, I mean Chuck Norris, the man who can kill two stones with one bird. (laughs) He's got the puffed up chest, the gravelly voice, and that famous Chuck Norris tough guy squint. He might as well be holding a machine gun as he gives notes. And it's not just Chuck. Jessica's the only kid in the class. Everyone else is a grown-up. And these guys are all total pros. Like take Jessica's scene partner, for example. He's none other than David Joyner, fresh off his big break as Barney the Dinosaur on PBS. Whoa, say no more. (laughs) This is the real deal. (laughs) It is. But for Jessica, at 12 years old, it's terrifying. And it gets worse because some of Chuck's teaching methods are a little unconventional. Halfway through her scene with Barney, Chuck holds his hand up and growls at Jessica. You have too much expression. Then he slowly crosses the room towards her, giving her that famous Chuck Norris squint the whole way. Chuck's like, do you know who the most powerful actor in the world is? Jessica thinks for a beat. She doesn't know, so she says nothing. Finally, Chuck growls, Denzel Washington. Denzel can say anything without moving his eyebrows. So, Jessica, I'd like to try something. Jessica grips the sides of her chair as Chuck yanks out a strand of scotch tape and proceeds to tape down her eyebrows. And then he says, okay, let's do the scene again. And Jessica does it. So if she ever wins an Oscar, she has to thank Chuck Norris and Office Depot. Yeah, basically. (laughs) And Chuck Norris makes her wear the scotch tape every time she does a scene. It's humiliating. Jessica hates every second. By the third lesson, Tina practically has to drag her from the minivan into class. But Jessica goes. Whatever discomfort or anxiety she's feeling, she pushes it down deep and locks it away. Because she's on a mission. And it's hard to imagine a bigger platform for a girl to change the world than the all-new Mickey Mouse Club. The Mickey Mouse Club Boot Camp is a two-week-long training program for the most talented kids in the country. But unlike the Chuck Norris School of Eyebrow Management, this is actually fun. Jessica has the time of her life. The show doesn't just fly out the kids who are auditioning. They put up their families, too. So over the course of those two weeks, Jessica becomes super tight with Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, Ryan Gosling. Future A-lister and panty dropper. And future husband of Arisha. (laughs) Yep. For two amazing weeks, everything is going according to plan. The casting director is even nudging Jessica's parents about how they're probably going to be moving to Orlando full-time soon. And Joe and Tina are all in. If Jessica gets this job, they're pulling Ashley out of school. They're quitting their jobs. They're going to Disney World for good. All the indications are that she's going to get this until the day of the big audition. Because there's a small detail I left out that changed everything. A new girl showed up at the last second. And she's the main reason Jessica was such a bundle of nerves that day. Jessica's jaw drops when she sees the new kid. She's got blonde hair, just like Jessica, brown eyes, just like Jessica. And then she introduces herself with an unmistakable Louisiana twang. Hi, 
I'm Britney Spears. Hi, I'm Britney, bitch. Yep. <laughs> Jessica's got a sinking feeling about this because it's obvious from her accent that this Britney girl is from the South. And when Britney lets slip in, oh my goodness, backstage, Jessica realizes she's not just from the South. She's a full-blown, God's honest Baptist choir girl, just like Jessica. So now the math has changed. Instead of one of 11 kids vying for eight slots, Jessica feels like she's one of two identical girls vying for the one blonde Southern Baptist Choir girl spot. And she is panicking because the casting agents are all so excited that Britney finally made it, fresh off her theatrical debut in New York. So I'm guessing no one had to tape her eyebrows down? No, she lucked out. <laughs> It's like everything Britney does is the perfect, effortless version of Jessica, which is why all of Jessica's self-doubt and anxiety come raging back up to the surface. And suddenly, Jessica's back home. Except home doesn't feel like home at all anymore. Disney World and the Mickey Mouse Club set felt like home. And now it's like some fantasy kingdom that Jessica got deported from. Meanwhile, Brittany, Justin, Christina, and Ryan are all on TV after school every weekday. They all promise to write Jessica, and she checks the mail every day, desperate to hear from them. But the letters never come. But then Ryan Gosling was like, I wrote you 365 letters. I wrote you every day for a year. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but Jessica doesn't stop crying for days. She cries at church. She cries at breakfast. She cries in the bathroom. It might be bearable if she had any kind of social life at school to go back to, but her friends are all from church and attend other schools. She's got nothing to distract her from what she sees as the failure of the century. It's several months after she got booted from the magical kingdom, but Jessica Simpson is back on her feet. She's got a wide smile on her face, a stadium full of cheering fans in front of her as she moves to the beat of a high school marching band. Stardom didn't really work out. So now Jessica's giving this whole normal kid thing a try. And for normal people in Texas, it doesn't get any better than being a football cheerleader. Jessica's loving it so far. She didn't have school friends to comfort her after the Disney rejection. And she feels like it's time to finally make some. And despite the fact that she's still painfully shy, she hits it off with another girl on the cheerleading squad and they start doing everything together. You never forget your high school bestie. Or your valet one. Yeah, I can't get rid of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's never had a bestie before and she shares everything with this girl. They talk about the teachers they hate and the boys they like. And as time goes by, they start to open up about more serious things. One night at a sleepover, Bestie tells Jessica that someone she knows had been sexually molested. And it makes Jessica feel comfortable and confident enough to talk about the abuse she suffered. It's the first time she's ever shared this with anyone besides her parents, which didn't go well. And this doesn't go that well either. Jessica was expecting some comforting words or a hug. But Bestie just kind of shuts down. Ugh, that's rough. But it is kind of understandable. I mean, she's just a kid too. Yeah, true. But there is no excuse for what she does next. A few days later, Jessica's heading to cheerleading practice, all excited to see her friends. But when she gets there, the vibe is icy. One of the girls says to Jessica, we know what you did. Jessica has no idea what she's talking about but she starts to get the idea when the girl calls Jessica a lezzy. As in a lesbian? Yep. But Jessica has no idea what lezzy even means. Her knowledge about sex only goes as far as abstinence is awesome. But then things go from bad to worse. In front of the whole squad, her bestie yells at Jessica, I told them what you did to me, how you tried to have sex with me at my house. My God. I mean, it's practically straight out of Mean Girls. Bestie was crushing on some dude, but the dude was crushing on Jessica. Bestie was pissed and used the biggest weapon in her arsenal. Her shitty personality? Yeah, and it gets even worse. 
kids start egging Jessica's house. One morning, she looks outside and her dad is trying to wash the words, die bitch, off the front of their garage, except it was shoe polish and it wouldn't come off. And when Jessica goes back out to cheer, the opposing squad starts chanting, lesbian, lesbian. Jessica runs off the field crying. And that's how her short career as a normal teen came to an end. She's like, get me the fuck out of here. Suddenly having your eyebrows taped down or bombing an audition, they don't seem that bad compared to high school. Because from that day on, Jessica realizes that ordinary isn't for her. She's still destined to be extraordinary. And now she's ready to try again. It's the summer of 1997, and 17-year-old Jessica Simpson is standing in front of a room full of executives at Jive Records in New York City. Her dad, Joe, has just finished delivering his pitch on why they should sign his daughter. Then it's Jessica's turn. Before she sings for them, she delivers the same message she's given at every record company she's auditioned for on this trip. I will only sign with you if you believe that I can change the world. The executives shift in their seats when they hear this. A few look sideways at each other. It's not the kind of thing they hear very often. Then Jessica starts to sing. Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. And she kills it. But when she's done, one of the execs levels with her. They think Jessica is amazing but they just signed a girl who's just like her and sang that exact same song. The exec is like, this girl, Britney Spears. You're joking. (laughs) Nope. (sighs) And at RCA, it's the same story, except the girl they just signed is named, wait for it, because the executive there can't even remember, (laughs) Christina Aguilar, I think. (laughs) Christina Aguilera. So by the time Jessica and her father are riding in the private elevator that goes to Sony boss Tommy Mottola's office, Jessica's getting desperate. She does not want to go back to Texas without a deal. She prays silently to herself. God, use me. I am here for your will. Okay, first of all, I thought we left Tommy Mottola in the Mariah Carey season. I really wish we had. But unfortunately, no. And he was obviously shitty to Mariah. But Tommy's still one of the biggest names in the business. And Jessica just wants to make music. Not to mention, he just might be her last chance. Tommy sits behind his desk and sizes Jessica up. Then he asks her straight off. So what do you want to do in life? Jessica's seen all the weird looks she's gotten so far on this trip. But she gives the same honest answer. She says... I want to be an example to girls all over the world that you don't have to compromise your values to be successful. Tommy makes a face like that's not what he was expecting to hear. This wave of terror washes over Jessica. She's definitely intimidated, but she keeps smiling. And then she starts to sing Amazing Grace. She closes her eyes and disappears into the song. And the next thing she knows, Tommy is interrupting her. That's enough. She opens her eyes and sees that Tommy's holding up a hand, like, stop. He tells her to have a seat. And he's like, you're great, kid, but I just signed your sister. Sorry, too slow. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) No, Jessica, though, thinks she's blown it again. But then Tommy walks out from behind his desk, stands in front of Jessica and says, I believe that your voice and who you are as a person and what you stand for can change the world. A tremor of relief shoots through her body. She didn't blow it. And not only did she not blow it, she found someone in the industry who wants to join her on her mission. But Tommy being Tommy, there's a catch. A few weeks later, Jessica and her whole family are back in Tommy's office to sign her record contract. A photographer captures the moment for posterity. And as soon as he snaps his last shot, Tommy turns to Jessica, looks her up and down and says, okay, 
you gotta lose 15 pounds. Or she could just fire this asshole instead. God, I wish. I mean, it's awful. She's 5'3 and 118 pounds, which she's never considered heavy. She must have misheard him, she thinks. So she says, what? And Tommy repeats, I think you're going to have to lose 15 pounds, maybe 10. Jessica just stares back at him. She wasn't expecting this. She turns to her parents, but they don't speak up either. Then Tommy spells it out for her. Because that's the image you want to have. That's what it will take to be Jessica Simpson. Okay, I hate to break it to him, but she's already Jessica Simpson? Yeah, he's definitely not the sharpest tool in the shed. (laughs) But he's just introduced her to this all-new Jessica Simpson. Similar, but different. Hotter, more marketable. And Jessica's like, if that's what it takes, that's what I'll do. She immediately starts taking diet pills. It's stressful and puts her on edge. But the way she sees it, God wants her to change the world with her voice. And apparently, the best package to do that in is a thin one. And her parents are on board with that? Yeah, like I said, they're all in. Joe even quit his church job. Jessica's the family business now, and they're all going to do whatever they have to to make sure that business is booming. Jessica's advance isn't enough to support the whole family. So Joe borrows $275,000 from a hockey team owner he knows in exchange for future earnings from Jessica's career. He's confident she'll make it all back. I mean, at least he didn't open a failed gym. (sighs) Live and learn. (laughs) So the whole family's all in on Jessica and Jessica's all in on her first album. But as she starts recording it in LA, she realizes something's missing. She doesn't have the church in Texas anymore. And all the people closest to her have a lot on the line for her career. She loves life in LA, but still, something's off. By the fall of 98, work on her debut album is wrapping up. A ballad of hers called Did You Ever Love Somebody is played on an episode of Dawson's Creek. Jessica nearly jumps off the sofa when it airs. She's always considered herself more of a Pacey girl. So the fact that her song was used during a kissing scene between Pacey and Andy makes it extra special. You know, my neighbor married Pacey, so that song must have done it for her. I think he goes by Dr. Death now. Oh, good promo. (laughs) Actually, that kissing scene is kind of what Jessica's missing, though. She's never had much of a romantic life. It's one of the things that got sidelined so she could pursue her career. And now, as she's singing all these romantic love songs from her album, she's starting to wonder, what is this love thing? Is there someone out there for me? Thankfully, the universe is like, yes and yes. Later that year, at the Hollywood Christmas Parade, Jessica notices a young guy standing in the distance. He's wearing white overalls with one strap undone, over this bright red long sleeve tee. Basically, he's the most adorable guy she's ever laid eyes on. Actually, a lot of teenage girls in America would agree with her because the guy is Nick Lachey from the boy band 98 Degrees. Nick and Jessica's eyes lock and she feels a wave of excitement shoot through her body. Nick flashes that smile that's launched a thousand tiger beats (laughs) and saunters over and says, hi, I'm Nick. Jessica smiles back and thinks, hello to the rest of my life. And even though they only chat for a moment, she can't stop thinking about him. I mean, he always made me way hotter than 98 degrees. Ugh, especially with that arm tattoo. Mm, you know it. He looks like a bad boy, but he seems like a good guy. Yeah, a lethal combination. So deadly. <laughs> but it's more than just a physical attraction. Jessica has never had much luck making connections with anyone outside her family. Exhibit A, her bestie back on the cheer squad. But there's something about this Nick Lachey that makes Jessica feel safe. She knows intuitively that she can trust him. It's a month later, and Nick and Jessica are on their first date. They're sitting on a hotel rooftop, looking out over the lights of Hollywood. They talk for hours about their families, their music, their hopes and dreams for the future. And everything that comes out of Nick's mouth is confirmation for Jessica that this guy is the real deal. He started out in a theme park barbershop quartet in Cincinnati, 
and through hard work and focus, he climbed his way up the industry ladder. The date is going perfectly until Nick reaches over and puts his hand on Jessica's. A shock of electricity moves through her body. And then she pulls her hand away and says, there's something I need you to know right away. I'm a virgin. So romantic. Mm -hmm. It's bachelor stuff right here. (laughs) If Nick is surprised or disappointed by this, he doesn't let on. He just nods and says, okay. So then Jessica doubles down. She's like, and I don't want to have sex until it's with the man I've married. Nick doesn't say anything for a few beats. He just looks out at the city and lets the information sink in. In the silence, Jessica's heart sinks. She's sure her virginity deal-breaker just broke the deal. I mean, why would a famous guy who looks like Nick Lachey be with a girl who doesn't put out when he can have anyone he wants? I mean, why would he wear only tank tops? There's a lot of questions. Yeah, that's probably the most important one. (laughs) But the answer for her is simple, because he really likes her. Nick looks into Jessica's eyes and says, I respect that. Thank you for telling me. And Jessica is thrilled. She's always believed that true love waits. And now she knows who she's waiting for. So with all the drama of a debut album and family finances and a new life in L.A. swirling around her, Jessica decides to go all in on a guy. What could possibly go wrong? This is episode one of our four-part series, Jessica Simpson, Blonde, Billionaire, Boss. We use many sources when researching our stories, but we especially recommend Open Book by Jessica Simpson. I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And I'm Brooke Sifrin. Dennis Hensley wrote this episode. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our senior producers are Natalie Shisha and Ben Gray. Our audio engineer is Sergio Enriquez. Sound design by James Morgan. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marshall Louie for Wondery.